What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Something that I have been loving lately about our interviews with couples is I feel like when we started this show, every interview kind of had the same context. It was like, how did you meet? What's your story? How'd you propose? But now we're just having like intentional conversations with couples that happen to relate to their marriage. Kind of feels like a double date. It does. You know? Maybe Philosophical discussions with other couples. We should rename the show Double Date. Double Date. I enjoyed this conversation with Kim and Erwin McManus. I wish we had another hour. Yeah. I wanted to ask them so many more questions because uh, their story is fascinating. Kim was an orphan. Erwin came from El Salvador, and now they uh, have formed a church called Mosaic. Yep, actually, which I actually attended in L.A. Yeah, and yep. actually they removed the term church, yep. so it's just called Mosaic. And their whole life philosophy is really interesting. He came to uh, know God as an adult, mm-hmm. and so I wanted to ask him why. You know, yep. It's like so interesting. I and was how that affects it. their marriage, because they yeah. met in seminary. Yeah. But the reason we're talking is because Erwin just came out with a new book called Mind Shift. And yeah. so we discuss a lot about mind shifts in this episode, including how powerful marriage can be with that, um, what it means to love deeply. And we tell about their their background story as well. A lot of good laughs in this. A lot of good laughs. And I would love to, to interview them again. So Erwin, Kim, thank you for the time. For those listening that want to see and get access to Erwin's new book, we'll link it down below. But... And for those listening that want to check out Erwin's new book called Mind Shift, we'll link it down below. Kim and Erwin, thank you so much for your time. We hope you listening enjoy this. And without further ado, we bring you Kim and Erwin McManus. We can okay. start with the fight that you guys were you know, just coming <laughs> yeah. out of. Because I, I thought that fighting would end at a certain point in marriage, but you're saying it doesn't. <laughs> now, we, we like to make it throughout the marriage. <laughs> it's best when it's... It's integrated. Um, yeah. We're celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary in January. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Yep. Married four years. We met when we were in our 20s. Uh, we were both getting our master's degrees. And um, we, we both met at seminary, of all places, to me. Wow. At seminary. I'm curious about what the first interaction was and, and when you guys first locked eyes, you know? <laughs> you are a true romantic. <laughs> like that when you're first locked eyes. If you locked eyes with someone the first time you met them, you would be a stalker, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so we had different memories when we first met. Uh, so the truth is that <laughs> no, we were we were actually first semester starting seminary, going we were in a church, we met there, and I thought your roommate was hot. <laughs> wow no he was a no Irwin but Irwin came with fire he came with fire and I think that that's what really just drew me in was his uh his passion his love for people and then we then he was working on the streets with the homeless and and then that was a big thing that that is a very passionate code word saying I wasn't anything for w- what she was looking for. <laughs> and uh, um, my first memory of meeting Kim, I had started a, um, a project in downtown Fort Worth for the homeless and um, for people just living on the streets. And, and I remember Kim was talking to this guy that was a pretty ruthless guy. He was really violent and um, very... Um, uh, aggressive. And one of the guys came to me and said, Hey, that young girl, she's talking to the wrong guy. And I knew he wouldn't hurt her, but I said, it's okay. Let her that she wants to come out here. She needs to know what the streets are really like. And so they had a pretty intense conversation. It didn't go well. She comes up to me, I'm tuning my guitar and, um, and she goes, can we talk? And I look at this girl and I go, yeah, yeah, just give me a minute. You know, I, I, I gotta get ready. And then she, she, um, She goes, can we talk right now? I said, yeah, just one minute. She turned around and started walking away. And I saw that she began sobbing. So I chased her. I put my guitar down. I chased her down, you know, the street. She's just crying out of control. And I said, don't cry. Don't cry. And she said, I want to cry. And I said, okay. 
cry, <laughs> cry. So that's my first conversation with Kim. <laughs> and so I always say I met Kim on the streets. <laughs> I only heard I only heard he chased me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are great. I and I was so excited for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Kim's dream was to marry a um a doctor who was going to be a missionary to Africa. And I'm a, a city guy. I'm from El Salvador, lived in New York and Miami. And um I I would have never been a doctor, but I have been a patient. And so I didn't really qualify. And, um, and I knew I was going to spend my life in cities, you know, and so we had very, very different pictures of a future. So we were friends and she did like one of my friends who actually wasn't my roommate, but um, she did like this guy that worked with me a lot. And I tried to set them up and, and, you know, and really for us, the beginning of it was just, we were just friends and we did, a lot of things together. We played racquetball together. Mm -hmm. She had a terrible temper and, uh, <laughs> and so, she'd lose a point and smash the racket against the wall. And, and, and then I'd let up and she goes, don't you let me. And she get angry if I let up. And then if I won the point, she get angry because she lost the point. And so our first date kind of together, we fought on the racquetball court. And after about 30 minutes, I looked at her and I said, Hey, when you learn how to play like an adult, give me a call. <laughs> oh, that's uh, it sounds like you're fiery too, Kim. You call you called Erwin fiery. She is but... nothing but fire. <laughs> but my his comes from passion. Mine is just anger. <laughs> Mine's just generally anger. <laughs> no, no. You know, Kim is a a farm girl, and she grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, and she was she won't tell you this because she's very. Uh, understated. Uh, but Kim was an orphan. She was abandoned. She was around eight years old in a government project, left starving. And a lot of her brothers and sisters ended up on the streets or drug addicts or drug dealers or criminals or uh, adopted. And and Kim had to survive really um, psychologically, at least on her own. She was in a foster home from the age of eight to 18 and never heard the words, I love you one time. Always ha ha wore clothes that were bought at thrift stores. And and really knew uh, abject poverty. And so she had to develop a toughness that very few people ever have to develop. Mm. And, um, you know, and I, I, if I ever met anyone in my life there, I feel like God just pulled them out of a terrible story and gave them an extraordinary future. It was Kim. That's right. Wow. How far into your guys' like dating lives or marriage did you end up in your respective fields? Hmm. Well, we we still don't know what my respected field is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she's always wondering what I'm doing this year. Or <laughs> yeah, and, uh, that's true. It, you know, we've been, it's been really amazing for me. Um, I, I'm always trying new things and I'm always innovating and inventing and creating something unexpected. And that, it would have never been possible for me. Kim has always trusted me as a person, as opposed to just trusting the idea. Mm -hmm. I, I think I had a lot of ideas Kim didn't agree with. A lot of ideas that Kim thought were crazy and would never work. But she always has always really consistently trusted me as a person. And that's what makes our marriage work. And, uh, and then I think from my end with her, I just began to realize that, um, Kim begins to die when she's not on an extreme mission. And when Kim can lead a, a group to Bangladesh and set young girls free from the sex trade and build a school or build a, a school in Malawi and give a future to an entire tribal community or work in India to develop women leaders, Kim is fully alive. And, and so I just realized early on that, um, I, I wanted to be married to the best version of Kim, and that best version was always when she was on some extreme mission. And I'm not going to stop her, so I might as well go ahead and be su super supportive and funded. <laughs> wow, Kim, your your Instagram <laughs> handle is Kim is alive. Where when did Kim's that originate? Alive. Where did that like, come from? Over 20 years ago, I've had that for over 20 years. Really, and I think that is at my essence that I really you know, aspire to be alive. 
And to answer your question, Sean, just how far into it did we start living, you know, the, the dream? My background was education, and so just I feel like in some capacity I've always been an educator. Uh, it just looks differently in, in different, you know, in different seasons of our lives. We were raising our kids, and then that looked like one thing, and then now that they're grown, it looks differently. I can travel the world and do, you know, very proactive educational initiatives, and that looks different. And then Erwin's always been, you know, doing a hundred different things, and I can't keep up with them, and that's what my life of anger. <laughs> you know. Describe the effect that uh, Kim trusting you has on you as a man, Erwin. Yeah, I think that early on, I I didn't have as much um, span of trust. She wanted to trust me, but it was really hard. And and a lot of it is, you know, even just our our faith background. Kim would say, "Just tell me that you know that God is in this, and I'm with you." And I, I grew up incredibly irreligious, and and I came to faith basically as an adult. Mm-hmm. And I, I was always uncomfortable with people who always said, God said this and God said this, because later on they would change your mind. And I'd go, I don't know if, if God changes his mind like that. And I think maybe you think God said it. And so I was always super respectful of saying whether I thought God was saying something. I didn't want to play that card in our marriage. And, and so I would say, I think this is the right thing, or I think this is an idea that's going to have a huge breakthrough. And it wasn't comforting to her. You know, she, she just wanted me to say, this is what God is saying for us to do. And if I had said that, she would have trusted me. And I was, even when I felt it was God, even in, when I sensed deeply inside of me, and I go, I, you know, this is, this is what God's calling me to do. I was always really apprehensive to um, speak on God's behalf that way. And, and so that was always a little tricky early on. And then I was doing stuff that no one was doing. I had no benchmarks. And um, of of the way I was even designing church life. I mean, I, I know I, I took the name church off of church before it was popular. And, uh, you know, even with Mosaic, it's not Mosaic Church. It's just Mosaic. And it, it put us in all kinds of heat with the whole Christian world. It's such a small thing, but it made people angry. You, you know, I, when I started bringing art and um, and dance and film and, you know, sketch comedy into our experiences on Sunday, that wasn't something Kim was excited about. She felt at first it was really sacrilegious and it would hurt people or or drive people away. And so early on, we had a lot of challenges because I I felt things incredibly intensely. Like, I have to do this. This is the way I'm going to create what um, I see in my soul. And, And I know Kim wanted to trust me but she also heard all the criticisms. She, she absorbed all the hate. She absorbed everyone who said negative things about me. And, and they would go to her. And I think it created so much pain for her. And it, would that be mm-hmm. fair? That's true. And so I, it took us years, I think, before we got to a place where Kim, um, like I would say to Kim, this is what I'm here. This is what I see in the scriptures. And she would say, please don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I said, no, I, uh, Christianity is wrong. They, they've been reading the Bible wrong. This is not what this passage says. It says the opposite. And Kim would just, please, please don't, don't say that outside of the house. And, and I love the scriptures, and I believe in the Bible so profoundly that I think it's a terrible thing when we believe what we've been taught rather than what it says. And so I feel this deep conviction to uh, rip through our comfortable conclusions to truth. And that would create so much dissonance in our home. And so I took us, I would say it took us years. I mean, I do think there was a break point in our life where we just realized we're on the same team. And in some ways, sometimes it's us against the world. And it doesn't matter who joins us, who doesn't. We're on the same team together always. Was there a turning point for you, Kim, when it came to that of, oh, we are a team or I can trust him. Was there a moment that you can remember or a phase? Like what, what turned the page for you? I think it's, you know, it's sensitive. The moment I, I decided that 
this is a moment of, you know, absolute trust, was when I was watching his mom see him as the high schooler or not the man that he was, that I could see him as. And I had to take my stand behind him. And I said in my heart, I will always, uh, whether it's in front of his mother or in front of whomever, I stand with him. And it wasn't blind trust because I don't, I don't feel like I trust anybody blindly. I mean, I'm, you know, very skeptical with people. But trust that's, that's painless is easy. But we had gone through, you know, and we're going through and had lived a life already of broken trust. So it was, it was painful to say. Not between us. Not between us, but it, it was painful to say, I, I am going to trust this man and above all others. Mm. And he's, I've always had his back. I mean, even when he didn't know it. <laughs> and, I, and I probably openly said, I don't have your back. But I did have his back. <laughs> you know, it's just a journey. It's the journey that we've been on that we've, that we've had to stay connected like that. Well, no, early on in church life, we would have business meetings and Kim would stand up and oppose me in the business meetings. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so believe me, um, her trust was something I had to earn. And, and, and I realized early on that Kim was always going to act out of conviction. She was never going to conform. She was never going to just be compliant. That, that Kim was going to act out of conviction in her life. And so those are conversations that we had to have as a couple mm -hmm. and so that we could be on the same page when we walk out in public. Oh, so you're, so now the strategy is anytime there's disagreement, you do it with you, just you two and not in, in the boardroom. Is that you right? You also know what you're going to disagree about. Yeah. You do know what you're going to disagree about. <laughs> you, know? you know when you're going to do something and it's going to create tension. It's going to create conflict or confusion. One funny story is that about 10 years ago, I decided for the first time to go in, um, in the fashion industry, in the film industry, sort of a, a, a business. And, um, and, and I didn't even know if I was going to stay uh, pastoring. And I, I, I went and got Kim. We went and got breakfast and had coffee. And I said, honey, um, I'm going to, pivot in the next 20 years of my life, I'm going to be an artist. And I just want to, you know, let you know and make sure it's okay and help, you know, and, and I'm going to, you know, go in, start designing clothes and bags and make films and create art. And, and I'm still going to follow Jesus, but I'm not going to do it in the same, you know, in the same way. And she said, sure, go right ahead. She was so incredibly supportive. It was like the most beautiful moment. And a year later, she says, hey, we, we need to talk. And I said, uh, oh, sure. But about what? She goes, it seems like you've suddenly gone off and become this like fashion designer and film guy. And, <laughs> and what, what, what about ministry? What about the church? And, and, I, and she goes, we, you've never, you need to talk to me about where you're going, where we're going. <laughs> and I said, honey, we did have that talk a year ago. And she said, that talk didn't count because I didn't believe you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that situation well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, but what's I, funny is she ended up loving it. I ask about that that moment of unification because this this is our seventh year of marriage. Well, I guess sorry, we're eighth. we're on our eighth year of marriage, and it really has been a formative year where we've felt that. Like there's just been a couple significant life events that have happened where we've just had to turn to each other and be like, oh yeah, you, you're my number one team. Like you're my number one priority and almost explicitly say it. And it was such a profound experience where I'm like, marriage is so fun. And like, I even view conflict differently where it is more of a, of a team effort of, oh, hey, yeah. she's disagreeing with me, but it doesn't need to be super contentious. And it's really just her different perspective, which is highly needed to balance out my perspective. And so I'm, I'm like trying to think, can you front load that earlier on in a marriage as opposed to having to wait seven years, 10 years to, to reach that point? Because it's also interesting, Erwin, you saying, if I had just told Kim that God is telling me to do this, then she would have been behind it. But the very discipline of you not telling her that is what builds the trust over time. 
And it's like, right. maybe it is just a, a, a result of timeliness, you know, but I don't know, just thoughts. I, I, I do think that different personalities, I was going to say men and women, but I don't know if that's always the case, but um, some people move from thinking single to married faster than other people. Mm. And I find a lot of times men, when they get married, are still thinking like a single guy who's now married. And the wife is thinking like a married person who used to be single mm. and has to make individual choices. And so in your marriage, you still have to make individual choices. Mm. And that are really about your <clears throat> unique calling or gifting or personality. And, and now you have to make it in a different process. And, and so we will go back and forth. Like, I mean, frankly, Kim will book a trip to Malawi and forget to tell me. Like, I, I will see it at the office on a calendar. Oh, she's leaving on Tuesday. It's good to know. But when she used to do that, I would get angry. But not because I was really angry, but because, you know, you're playing the chips game. You know, and, you know, so now if I do a stupid thing or if I plan a trip without telling you, you can't get angry at me. And and I realized a long time ago, oh, if I get angry, she's still going. But now she goes and she's sad. Yeah. And we're angry and we're not together. And and so now it still happens now. And uh, she'll plan a trip and then I'll just go. I'm so I'm so happy for you. You, you mm. know, I just want to know so that I can plan my life, too. And, and what's crazy is like my schedule is insane. If Kim wanted to live holding things over me, she could do it every five minutes of my life because, you know, she may plan that trip to Africa and forget to let me know, but I have stuff all the time that's messing up our life. Yeah. Things all the time that are changing our schedule. And if she was always holding me to, Hey, you didn't tell me in time, our marriage would be miserable. And so a lot of it is just going, I'm just gonna give the other person grace I know they're deeply committed to me. And I know when they make decisions like an individual, it's sometimes because they didn't have time or forgot to process it. And Because a lot of times we're so close, we think we told each other and we didn't. Mm. And, you know, and I, and I said, honey, I told you. She goes, you did not tell me. And I'm like, in my head, I'm so sure I told her. And, but, but she's really saying whether I told her or not is, you didn't process this with me. And, and so I, I'm blindsided. Yeah. And so I think a huge part of marriage is realizing you have to give each other enough room to still make individual choices and not see that as them, like not respecting the marriage. And at the same time, you need to do everything you can to realize you're no longer processing life alone. The earlier you can bring them into the process, the more they feel connected. Mm. The earlier you're brought into the process, the more you feel respected. And I think that's a really important part of it. Uh, Erwin, you've been named, titled as a cultural architect. What do you and pe people mean by that? Well, it really comes out of my first book uh, called An Unstoppable Force, where I, I, I wrote a book about cultural movements and how empires emerge, how movements happen. And, and I think early on, um, I worked as in my 20s and 30s, I worked as a futurist and I worked with organizations and helped them figure out how to have the kind of culture that is relevant to the world around them. And so a lot of it is because we, um, at that time, 40 years ago, we're not really paying attention to culture. We just thought culture was something that just happened, but, but culture is something that's created. And so I was really interested in, like, in, in cultural change. How do you create cultures where um, people are developed to achieve their greatest potential? How do you create a culture where people are highly valued and feel appreciated? How do you create a culture where there's um, transparency and authenticity and integrity? And so being a cultural architect for me was um, looking at people not as individuals simply, but as an interconnected whole, that when we do things Together, we create either a positive or a negative culture. And, you know, maybe being an outsider, being from El Salvador and having uh, English as my second language and, and American culture as a secondary culture for me made me really aware of the fact that cultures are different. And, and, and you know, when you go to church, it's a, churches have huge cultures. 
and they, they don't have rules, they have cultures. And, you know, and so if you walk into a church and, uh, and you're dressed wrong, uh, you've really offended people. Or, uh, you know, if you walk in church and you do something that isn't a part of the culture. We, you lived out in L.A. and you lived, you know, near the ocean. And what's interesting is that there are really no laws that say you can take your shirt off on the beach, but you can't take your shirt off once you're in Santa Monica Pier or on Third Street Promenade. There's just a natural cultural awareness oh, I can take my shirt off here and I put it on here. Culture is actually more powerful than rules and laws. And so what you can know is the moment you have rules and laws, you lack culture. The moment you have a healthy culture, you actually don't need rules and laws. And that's why early on I became known as a cultural architect because I would meet with organizations, help them think through how do you create the kind of culture that creates a better world. Do you guys, Kim feel like you've built a, a family culture? And if so, can you describe what that is? Like your marriage culture, your family culture? I'm curious what the McManus a, household. I, I love that question. I love that question. I've never been asked that question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have. And I think that's been very intentional um, because it's not something that we ever had. Um, or when, you know, broken home, a broken home. And it was the intentionality of our marriage that we said we are going to create something here that's going to last. And we didn't speak it like that. We just knew that's what we wanted. And the culture was built on, you know, creativity and learning and travel and, and serving people and ministry and caring and, and really trying to give our, our kids freedom to be who they, you know, were meant to be, mm. you know, education, because I came from that background. I thought, oh, we do it one way and realized the way that it's done here was not working for our children. Every time we took them, uh, you know, on a trip, they would come back and feel the pressure of failing in class because they'd been gone for so long. And so we just realized, oh, our culture is not like every other family. We're going to take them out of school. We're going to homeschool. We're going to do something. We're going to do something different. And ours doesn't have to be like every other family that we saw. And because I was very much about comparing our family to somebody else and hoping that we would measure up as, you know, as you do. But then I realized it's just not working. It took me years to figure that out. But all the while, Erwin is really, really good at gearing the ship. And, and so we found our way when other people weren't doing it the way that we were doing it. And we had to be okay with that. And we had to be okay with the love of less people. And then, but to have our kids strong and, and, and grounded. Mm. And every time they felt grounded in us, even though we were maybe in different places and not always home, they, they, they felt like, oh, okay, we can, we can do this. We can do this. And they grew up to be amazing people, amazing yeah. humans. Okay. You know, Sean and um, Andrew, you, you guys were in L.A., and so you know that L.A. is not really a, um, a culture that has a high, high value for family. And, in fact, you'd have a higher value for your pet here than you would have children. <laughs> and, you know, so it's a very different kind of culture. So when you ask that we create a family culture, you know, I, I would say 75% of Mosaic is single. And... And so you don't have a lot of family culture in L.A. And then on top of that, even though they're single, they're, they're also very disconnected from their families. So you have an emerging environment here where families really diminished. And in fact, you know, the idea of a, of a husband and a wife or a mom and dad is almost seen as the last worst option of human, you know, expression. And so it's been really important for us because, um, you know, on the spectrum of liberal to conservative, I'd say probably 95 percent of Mosaic would be liberal Democrats or socialists uh, as far to the left as you can go. And so here, Kim and I, we've been married for 40 years and, um, you know, we our kids live within 10 minutes of us because they want to be our friends and they're adults now and they want to live in relationship with us. And we're trying to model something that is no longer really advocated or believed in. Mm. 
And we, we're, we're not like preachy about it. We just do it by living our life and, and trying to be an expression of something that's still really wonderful. Mm. And yeah, and, and so it's an interesting kind of dynamic here. And I think that's why a lot of the people who come to Mosaic actually listen to us is because there's a sense of, of the aspirational nature of, oh, it's possible to have someone love you all your life. Oh, it's possible to actually, marriage isn't just an illusion. Marriage isn't just something antiquated. It's something that is real. And, you know, it's, it's not just an obligation. It can actually become an extraordinary experience. And, you know, I, I don't want people to think we've been married for 40 years because we have simply a biblical obligation to be married. And uh, we've been married for 40 years because Kim is awesome. And we have this beautiful relationship and we keep <laughs> growing and you can, you can experience a level of love when you fight through the hard things with someone mm. that you cannot experience if you just keep bailing out, moving from person to person to person. Yeah. And, and so I think there's a deep, rich message that I, is really important, not just by what we teach, but what we live. We've been lucky enough on the show to interview hundreds of couples, 99.9% .9 of which have come on the show and basically said just that, that they're in a marriage, they're happy, they've gone through so many ups and downs, but if it weren't for the marriage, they wouldn't be who they are. Mm -hmm. Why do you think in today's culture, especially like you were saying in LA, there's such this fear from millennial like millennial generation gen z's younger kids of i could never do that because it will fail miserably mm. i think one of the reasons is because they come from a culture where parents said one thing and did the other and mm. they would rather not um break commitments than make them mm. and you know you can you can go through a divorce, but you don't also want to be a hypocrite. And so they decide, well, if there's two wrongs, I'll just pick one wrong, you know, or one lesser. And so I actually think that a part of the huge problem, of the culture, everybody blames the culture that's emerged. But the, the reality is that a lot of people grew up in homes where even though their parents didn't divorce, their parents were miserable mm -hmm. and there was no love. It was a, a cold and indifferent space. And they watched one of the parents die inside. And, you know, the solution to believing in marriage isn't staying in marriage. The solution to believing in marriage is to have a vibrant, wonderful relationship with another human being that lasts a lifetime. And, you know, and, and so I think part of the problem is that we sometimes we have more commitment to the rules than we have to the essence that the rules are supposed to support. And if we want people to believe in marriage, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to believe in love again and, and how to um, fight through the conflicts and the imperfection. Uh, you know, the, the reason marriages are hard is because human beings are imperfect. You know, the reason it's hard for our marriage to work is because I'm imperfect. And I'm not going to speak on Kim's behalf <laughs> and, uh, because I want to stay married another 40 if I'm still here. And... But it's it, and if you if you always tap out when life gets hard, you actually never grow. You stay the same person. Mm. Mm. And so I, I think it's not just about people aren't willing to stay married. I don't think people are willing to grow yeah. and change and deepen as human beings. As I talk to people, the cheapening of the expression of love is is uh with social media and with all of these apps and finding it's so hard. It's so hard in this context to find true love, you know? And I don't know why we, we found it, but I know it's been hard for the people that we serve, that we love deep, deeply to find love hmm. in its most beautiful, wonderful, you know, expression. But all I know is I, I, I love Erwin and he's my best friend and that friendship has gotten us through. I want that for other people, the people that we love. <clears throat> I just can't, I can't make it happen. Hmm. And that's very frustrating. 
this yeah. culture. Yeah, I, I tell people, if you want to be rare, like, if you, you know, in LA, everybody wants to be unique. And so if you want to be rare, love deeply. Because mm -hmm. love is actually a very rare commodity in the human experience. Can you uh, use a cinnamon, synonym for love deeply? Like, what is, is that? Uh, say it differently for me. I'm curious. Care about the other person more than you care about yourself. Mm hmm you know that to me that's what loving deeply is and um it's you're valuing the other person more than you and i'm not happy because kim makes me happy i actually experience happiness because i make kim happy like mm. when kim is happy i experience a deep deep level of joy like when kim is fulfilled I feel a deep sense of fulfillment and it, yeah. you know, so it, it's interesting. It's it, if marriage is still a negotiation where you're going, okay, I'll make you happy. You make me happy. Yeah. It, you know, you're, you're still basically using a utilitarian formula to try to make a relationship work. I actually experience happiness when I see Kim happy, hmm. when I know she's happy, that by itself is a reward to me. And, and so I don't need her then to make it even and make me happy. Because I'm already ahead. Yeah. Because when I see her living the life she wants to live, I feel this incredible sense of fulfillment. <laughs> and, and you know, there's a lot of things you do wrong in life. But um, I'm not really sure why, but I do think it's, it is because when I met Kim and I, and I knew she was an, I knew, learned, I learned she was an orphan and I learned her life story. I actually thought to myself, I'm going to get the privilege of loving this person all of their life. Hmm. As opposed to, I'm going to get the privilege of being loved by this person. And so I didn't marry Kim with a sense of guarantee that she would always love me. I, I married Kim with a guarantee that I, was lo I would always love her. And then if she always loved me, that was a value added on top of that. Yeah. And it I, I think that's what it means to love deeply. And is where that person's life and value has greater significance to you than even your own. And I know, I, I feel like Oprah says that's not good. That, you, know, that it's, yeah. you know, it's really important, you know, to love yourself most. And I understand the psychological weight of what is being said in culture. I just don't know if love works as pragmatically as that. It's interesting. Cause I feel like it's a bit of a tug and war, like, you know, like the love deeply. I am, in my mind, I think of the word commitment or sticking to it. Like it has to yeah. love deeply means loving when there's a lack of a reason to do so. And, you know, I, you said Kim is awesome and I, Sean is awesome. But the truth is Sean is awesome some of the time, you know, <laughs> and not all the time. Like, and, and so that's where like this idea of commitment or obligation does kind of pick up the slack where my feelings sometimes can't. Whether you're trying to get pregnant, currently pregnant, or breastfeeding, it's hard to ensure your body is getting all of the nutrients it needs to thrive. Nutrition in general isn't a one-size-fits-all thing, and I know with pregnancy, Sean spent so much time looking into the top-of-the-line product. This is why I'm passionate about Genate. They use a cutting-edge approach to prenatal nutrition by looking at your genetics. It's fascinating. I took the Gene 8 test while I was pregnant and it gave me recommendations for nutrients my body has difficulty metabolizing that are important for my baby. It turns out I have a genetic variant that affects my iron metabolism. So getting the Gene 8 prenatal supplement that delivers the amount of iron my body needs was a game changer. After looking into the research Gene 8 has done, it's crazy how much a mother's prenatal nutrition really does affect the developing baby. It's so important. Plus the Gene 8 team also provides a registered dietitian to help women better understand their Gene 8 test results. I met with their dietitian and took away some great advice on how to support my pregnancy and my baby with the right nutrition. It's been really helpful to do such a deep dive into my nutrition and ensure baby boy here is getting what he needs. We highly recommend this product and by purchasing a Gene 8 test and nutrition bundle, you'll have confidence that your nutrition needs will be taken care of. Head to gene to learn more. We'll link it down below. Let's get back to it. But Andrew, you did say something about uh, commitment and obligation. Yeah. And 
if I could, man, I hate the word obligation. Sorry. <laughs> I, but I love the word commitment. Okay. And uh, I, I do think that what makes a difference when you talk about loving deeply is commitment. And it's, it's not building the relationship on feelings or emotions, but on commitments and values. Hmm. And, but not obligation. And um, because when you do something out of obligation, it means that you're making a choice based on external factors rather than internal factors. Mm. And what you're actually saying is that you've made internal choices that have now informed every choice you're going to make in the future. Mm. And so it's, you, you know, uh, maybe one time when you were a kid, you, you know, you uh, ate or you drank something toxic and you made a decision, I'm never gonna do that again. You're not living out of obligation because you're not drinking that toxic material. And uh, you're, you've learned and you've made a choice that informs your whole life. Or you exercised when you were a kid and you decided, I wanna be a world-class athlete. And uh, the person who does that out of obligation will never make it to the top. It's the person who does it out of commitment. Mm. And, and there has to be a deeper, fuel of that commitment, which is love, you know? And so in your, in your marriage, when you're doing things out of obligation, you start tallying the points, you start paying attention to how much you do and how much they do. And you want to make sure they, they feel as obligated as you. Yeah. When you do things out of commitment, their response is not dependent on your choice. I, I accept and receive that differentiation. I appreciate that. That's, that's really good. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned something earlier about staying the same person if you don't have a, a tool or, you know, a relationship or I don't know, maybe like a love like marriage. Um, those are my words more than yours. But I feel like that lends itself well to transitioning us into your newest book, Mind Shift. Congratulations. But this is all hey, about thank you so much. This is all about, um, you know, this journey that begins. It, you, let's go. There it is. Looking good. Yo, I just got it. Tell, <laughs> congratulations. Tell us, tell us about this book. You know, this, this book to me is one of the most important books I've written in that uh, I began writing it actually in 1990 is when the concepts in the book began to form in my mind. Uh, I spent, well, we spent 10 years of our lives working with the urban poor, working with people in really uh, desperate situations, um, underserved um, and, 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 and in deep struggles. And one of the things I, I began realizing very early on is that you can give people opportunities, but you cannot give them determination uh. that um, what's really important if you're going to help a person make mental break or uh, mental breakthroughs in their life, life breakthroughs, is they need the internal mental constructs for success. And, and then now, you know, 40 years later, when I work with billionaires and the, the really the top leaders in the world, I find the exact same situation. <laughs> and, and so what's interesting to me is the same things I saw when I was working with the poor, are the same things I see now working with incredibly um, affluent and successful, it's, uh, it's internal mental limitations that actually hold us back. And if mm. we don't pay attention to the, our internal structures, um, we will actually become our own worst enemies. And so the book is really focused not just on developing the structures to survive failure, but the internal structures to survive success mm. and because the weight of success can be more destructive and crushing than the weight of failure in people's lives. What do you mean? How Convi that's, it comes off as so hard to believe. It's like, what do you mean? If I had, if I had a million dollars in the bank and a nice house, what, why would, why would I struggle with that? So when you were an NFL player and you had your best day, did you still wonder if your life mattered? Yes. All right. That's what I mean. And, uh, and Sean, when you were at the top of your Olympic career, did you ever feel like you still were not worthy of love or, um, or this wasn't going to last because you didn't deserve it? Absolutely. And, and that's what I'm talking about is that you cannot have enough success to outgrow um, the internal structures that become self-destructive that actually limit us, that actually hold us back. 
And, mm -hmm. and why this became so important to me is that I'm a person of deep faith. I'm a person who believes deeply in Jesus. And I've been working with people for, we've been working with people for 40 years together. And I wish I could tell you that believing in Jesus instantly changed a person's internal mental structures, but it does not. You can believe in Jesus and still have destructive internal narratives. You can believe in Jesus and still have bad thinking. And it's so important to understand that God designed you a certain way. And so when you believe in Jesus, you still have to drink fresh water. You still have to breathe in oxygen and you still need to eat food. If you believe in Jesus and eat unhealthy food, you will get fat and unhealthy. If you believe in Jesus and eat food that makes your cholesterol go up, you still may die of heart disease. You, you don't eliminate the consequences of bad decision making even when you have a deep belief in Jesus. And so if you want a washboard stomach, you don't pray more and read the Bible more, you do more sit-ups or you eat less carbs. And for some reason, there's a superstition that has attached itself to our faith where we go, all I need to do is believe in Jesus and then everything else works out. And, the answer, and really the reality is no, God designed you a certain way. And you still need fresh water, you still need good food, and you still have to breathe clean air if you're going to be a healthy human being. You still need proper mental structures if you're going to live an optimal life. And this book is committed to destroying internal limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the most important conversations you can have with a person when you realize bad thinking leads to bad choices, which leads to the life you do not want. And then you wonder, why did God let this happen to me? Wow. So we mentioned this last nine months or this year has been really formative for Sean and I and have has caused us to to look towards each other and strengthen each other. Um, one of the things that has happened is just a, a person in our close circle who had all the things, you know, just couldn't deal with the success, couldn't deal with the success. And it's, it's interesting, Kim, and I'm curious what mind shifts you feel like you've made, um, going from an orphan to living the life that you have now and, and unlocking these things. But I, I realize like in some situations when you're going from a difficult situation to trying to get out of it, it's, it's trying to deal with, you're trying to, to get out of that, you know, bad situation and, and, and look towards something different. But on the flip side of the coin, there's some people that just can't deal with peace or, stability and it's it's like this weird human quirk where i have to change something or let me swing bigger or you know take take an unnecessary risk but anyway um it's been interesting to observe i'm i'm curious your journey though kim i think you're right as far as success being very difficult or even in my mind sometimes i wonder do i am i worthy of that can i even attain that is it you know from where I came from, it was never in anyone's imagination. I have ten, I have nine brothers and sisters. No one's imagination that anyone would graduate from high school. Hmm. Therefore, as a child, you know, number six child, I was the first to graduate from high school, probably in generations. Hmm. <clears throat> the first to go to college, the first to go on. And so, to get her master's degree. <clears throat> and so there were already things set up in my brain before I went to foster care. And even in foster care, when my foster parents were not, you know, they were farmers. They were people who were very simple. They had also dropped out of school. So education was so undervalued because they didn't value human potential. And, and I, I struggled with that. And with a, a lot of other issues, like, I think he wrote the book for me. He's trying to help me. He's tr the man is trying to help his wife out, you know, because he's, <laughs> he's had to live and sleep with this all of his adult life. Just my, the, the things, the, the constraints I put on myself, the constancy of those things that I have to say, mm. oh, those are, that's a belief. That belief isn't right. 
I got to go back. I got to go do this over. I got to start thinking why. And even recently, I think I, I just told her and said, I, I don't see the value in positive thinking. I think it's so overrated. <laughs> and it's part of my giving up, you know, <laughs> like, am I just giving up at 64? And because Erwin is such a positive person, I'm like, I'm owning my own negativity <laughs> thinking, you know, if I was a brain surgeon, if I see the, the tumor I, that I have to, I can't just respond positively. I have to say, I got to take it out. So oh, I, I that's think, a positive response. I can take it out. I can take it out. <laughs> see, but I'm like, why are you always so positive? Why do you have to be so positive? Uh, so I'm my own worst enemy in my head. Is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. What's really funny is we had COVID a few weeks ago <laughs> and I tested positive three times over a week and Kim tested, even though she was so sick, she tested negative four, th times. four times in the week. Wow. And she looked at me, she goes, this is proof that I'm always negative. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was another end, kind of an indicator. Yeah. So I, I forgot the original question, but I was it's raised to have a mindset that thinks always in the dark. When you're poor, you're oftentimes raised with a very fixed mindset. Hmm. And so you think there's a limited amount of everything in the world and limited amount of intelligence or talent, but a limited amount of money and food. And one of the things you really have to shift in your mind is this um, idea that if someone else has, they just took away from you mm -hmm. and they have begun to have a, a, an abundance mindset where you begin to realize um, that someone else's success doesn't get in the way of my success. Uh, mm -hmm. What someone else has doesn't take anything away from me. In fact, if anything, it's an indicator. If someone else succeeds, I can succeed as well. And so there are like these subtle, they're almost granular, small shifts. They're not massive, mm -hmm. but they're so significant that when you make that small shift, it changes your life. Mm -hmm. and, and like one of them, I think in chapter three, um, the chapter is you can't take everyone with you. One, one of the great challenges, you know, both, both for Kim and I, was that whenever we would make choices that would change our life, whenever we'd make choices to grow, there were people who were not happy. They were not happy for us. They felt like we'd abandon them because we were growing and changing and we'd invite them to come with us, but they didn't want to make the sacrifices and uh, take on the discipline to change. And one of the hardest things for Kim is realizing that people she loves, people in her family, people who yeah. were in the church that, um, she wanted to take with her that they didn't want to come with her. And you have to have a mindset that says, look, you know, people matter the most. And cause that's the opening chapter. It's all about people. But then two chapters later, it's, you can't take everyone with you. And that's one of the great tensions in life is mm -hmm. to realize that, um, if you stay around people who are underachievers, you will be an underachiever all your life. Mm -hmm. If you stay around people who are, uh, you're drinking buddies, you're going to be drinking all of your life. If you're going to actually change the internal structure of your life, you have to be committed to change the external circumstance of your life. Mm. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. As January continues, don't lose sight of the New Year's resolutions you set for yourself. It can be easy to set big goals and want to see a big change, but putting in the work to actually become your best self can sometimes feel overwhelming. A great way to hold yourself accountable to becoming the best version of you is through therapy. Therapy isn't just for individuals or couples going through traumatic events. It's a great tool for daily life that equips you for everyday situations and can help strengthen your relationships. Sean and I personally love therapy. It's helped our relationship tremendously. We tell all our friends and family that we highly recommend therapy, especially if you're married or engaged or hope to be one day. If you're thinking of trying therapy but don't know where to start, BetterHelp is a great option. It's all online, so it's suited to fit your schedule. And all you do is fill out a quick questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can also switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Let this month be the month you prioritize you with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash EastFam today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash EastFam. Golly, I... I got the chills when you were describing the subtle shifts that can make such a drastic impact. And I think I, I immediately thought of the several mentors that I've had that have made those shifts for me. And actually, I mean, one of the lessons that I've learned in marriage is Sean will have some insecurities sometimes that are really like a, a barrier to 
allowing me to love her or it like it hinders the furthering of our relationship because she's just like the, some in some things mm -hmm. and it's been really cool to see that grow out <clears throat> and i have my own things <clears throat> but like it caps how close and intimate our relationship can be and i know i we've had the opportunity to interact with s some billionaires and it's such a fascinating experience to sit there and listen to them you know describe their vision for how they're gonna construct this property or change this city and the point is not that money solves problems it's just like th their canvas is more easily materialistic things but maybe your canvas is family maybe your canvas is your marriage maybe your canvas is you know your your church or whatever it is but it's like gosh we are made in god's image and and when you realize that there's this beautiful creative aspect or like this oh man like the the sky is the limit type thing it it's a really profound kind of thing kind of experience that we've been fortunate enough to to confront several times in our life so thank you for the book and i think it's incredibly powerful i thank you so so much and um, I, I'm very excited about it. And, you know, one of the little tweaks, you, you actually sent us a note about these three phrases, mental toughness, mental clarity, mental health. But I actually wanted to throw a fourth one in there that I think is maybe the most important, and that's mental agility. Mm. Uh, you know, Kim is much younger than me, but <laughs> I, I turned 65 a couple of weeks ago. And I've never felt more mentally agile in my life. Uh, I've never felt more curious, more inventive, more imaginative. And um, one of the things that you need in life to really um, destroy every ceiling is not just mental clarity and mental health and mental toughness. You need mental agility. You need the ability to keep thinking differently, to think outside of the box, to think inventively, creatively, to adapt to new environments, new circumstances, new cultures, a new world. And in this study, it's interesting, I, I've worked with three neuro clinics um, over the years, and in one of them, they said, hey, we, we've discovered the lubricant of the brain, the ingredient that actually keeps the human brain pliable and adaptive. And it's not, world, it's not word puzzles. You, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not reading. It's, um, it's, and even though uh, racket sports are really important, it's not even just racket sports. <laughs> uh, the, the lubricant of the brain, they discovered, is this thing called gratitude. Mm. And gratitude from a scientific perspective is seen as the lubricant of the brain. Mm. And when you remain grateful and you posture your heart to be thankful for your life and the people in your life. And, uh, and I actually think it's interesting because you know, worship, whether a person is a person who believes in God or not, worship is a recurring act of gratitude. And who would have ever guessed that the experience of worship where you're expressing thanks and gratitude will, would actually have a neurological effect on keeping your brain agile, flexible, and pliable, which makes perfect sense because when you connect to God, you're gonna be most open to the uncertain, unexpected, and chaotic future, which mm -hmm. is really a, a really wonderful thing. And so one of the wow. things I really hope that this book does is not just give people tools to know how to survive life, you know, or, or tough it out, but to actually begin to thrive and enjoy life to the fullest level. Well, hopefully we can all be like Kim and have an Instagram handle like Kim is alive and thrive like that. Uh, yeah. But all right. I, it's the best one. <laughs> it is the best. It's the best. I have about a million more questions that, that I, I want to ask you all, but maybe it's a, it's when your next book comes out and we could do this in person. I'm so grateful for the time that uh, Kim, you and you and Erwin have given us. And for those listening that want to get access to Erwin's new book called Mind Shift, we'll link it down below. Um, it's important stuff. So thank you for the time. Gl glad to know you. And uh, hopefully there'll be a next time. It's great to thank meet you guys. And there will be a next time. Thank you. Take care. Yes. Thank you guys. Bye. Take care.